first, uh, welcome everyone in International E-Learning Session IIA Indonesia with team internal audit roles in business recovery helped by IIA Indonesia. I'm glad everyone can make it today. And um, please uh, feel free, feel comfortable during the session here. And I would like to say hi first to the member of IIA Indonesia. Thank you for coming in. And Miss Ida Sundari, thank you, Ibu, for welcome for enter come in in the webinar. And please, all the participants can try to chat. Yeah, chat in the chat room because uh, we want to have the discussion interactive. Therefore, if you have any question, any response, please chat in the chat room, either in Indonesian language or in the English language. Uh, today, we're delighted to have Ms. Helen T. D. Guzman, President of ICIAA. 2015 to 2016, and also president of IIA Philippines in 2006, former chief audit executive of Manila Electric Company. Thank you. Welcome, Miss Helen. Thank you. Thank Before you. we start uh, the session, I would like to check the mic of Miss Helen. Can yeah. you say a few words, Miss Helen? Yeah, okay. Right, Is everyone uh, hear it clear enough? Good morning, everyone. This is Helen. I morning, hope Helen. you hear me. Yeah. Good, morning. Good morning, Helen. It's clear. <laughs> uh, your, your son is good. Mm -hmm. Magandang umaga. Magandang umaga, Mrs. Helen. Magandang umaga din. Thank you for welcoming me. Okay, thank you. Ibu Dini masih mute tuh. Sorry. Yeah, please, Miss Helen. We yes. start the session and the screen is yours. Yes. Thank you, Miss. Okay. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Good morning to everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be with you this morning for this specific uh, session on internal audit roles in business recovery. Uh, just to give you a background, you know, when I was approached by I Indonesia about this topic, I was quite uncomfortable, primarily because we are still in the pandemic and uh, whether we could see in the horizon the business recovery. But there are many insights that you can learn from this, no? moving forward. Uh, by first really understanding where we are right now so we can better prepare how to prepare also ourselves when business is going to recover. So I have uh, made an outline for this session. Um, I divided the session into three parts. First is really a situationer, meaning where are we now in the present state of uh, the economy of the different ASEAN countries. Uh, I would try to give you a general update, a more recent one, the, what, the one that I can get or made available across Asia, specifically in Southeast Asia. Uh, I tried to zero in to Southeast Asia because this is more close to our heart yeah, and how it has impact business. And then the second part, we will be talking about internal audit and this pandemic. No. Uh, you know, the last pandemic that we had, uh, a medical pandemic, was the SARS. But it was not this kind of magnitude that we are now experiencing. You know? It's really global. And so this is like there is no reference to consider how the economy or the business is going to uh, behave or uh, respond or even recover considering the magnitude of this pandemic. 
And the third part, we will be talking about the roles of uh, internal audit under the new normal, uh, the new way of doing things now and proceeding to the business recovery. So let me now start with uh, the situationer on uh, the updates on COVID. So let me just show you a few slides. And this is how uh, Southeast Asia, in particular ASEAN countries, uh, experienced uh, the daily cases of COVID. And in, if not, most of the countries uh, started to institute lockdown as early as February. But since the figures are very small yet, uh, I started to uh, picture or get the data starting March. You know, since most of the countries that started lockdown started it in March. So if you look at this graph, uh, Philippines and Indonesia are so prominent. So it might be embarrassing on my part, but this is reality and the truth no? that we had now at present, this is July, our cases has really ballooned to the level of about 4,000 plus. There was a day that we had a 4,000 cases in one day and still going up again this August, if you look at the figures. No? So it's alarming, but look at Indonesia, while it has gone up for a while, we have now far, uh, 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 meaning we went ahead over you. No? Okay, now in terms of uh, cases to date, meaning the running cases, if you look at the graph, well, Singapore, Philippines, and Indonesia are seems to be the one more prominent in terms of movement. And the other Asian, ASEAN countries are tapering already. So this is what you call flattening the curve already for other ASEAN, except for the three. And uh, as I said, uh, while Indonesia will have a higher uh, number, but if you equate this to your population, you are still lower compared to the Philippines. Um, the Philippines may appear a second, but when we equate it to population or compare this to our population, the ratio is higher over Indonesia. So we are still at the, uh, I'm not saying if this is the peak, we don't know if this is the peak, but we are still there, uh, still moving. No? And uh, we really don't know when is it going to taper off or when is it going to flatten. No? It just simply shows that uh, there are still many cases that we have to watch. And I think the governments, our respective governments, is trying to balance between you know, uh, going with the normal life by having businesses flourish also, but at the same time protecting deaths among the different cases that we have uh, in COVID, you know, involving COVID. Now, I got this figure from, I got this slide from the ADB because I think we, the ADB is the, a, a good uh, reference uh, for purposes of determining how COVID has affected the economy of uh, more of the Asian or you know, the ASEAN countries. And this was released, I think, last April. Uh, 2020. But the, 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 the information that we obtain here more or less mirror what is really happening. And so it is divided into three uh, segments. One is trade impact. The second is the impact on supply and demand. And this, this aspect will really dictate also in terms of the availability of, of goods and services as well as the impact on the way uh, Life goes on in every uh, country. And then the, the third section speaks about the policy response. So this is really what government is doing to alleviate the, the conditions of the country uh, because of the effect of the COVID-19. So we'll start with uh, uh, the trade impact, okay? So COVID has lowered tourism arrivals and of course the related revenue relief. Uh, primarily because with the lockdown, uh, countries have been uh, stopping, you know, travel, especially coming from outside the country, you know, and so tourism has really gone down. Second is that there were lower goods trades, meaning import-export, because there is no transportation, uh, ship and uh, Air, uh, airlines are stopped uh, during a lockdown. So this has resulted to a higher trade cost. No? So uh, that, that was one of the impact on the economy on the trade. Now on supply, uh, and let me just give you what uh, 
uh, ADB is telling us. No? There is a supply chain disruption because of the lockdown and of course the quarantine measures for, for the community. No? And it has affect, affected countries that are dependent, especially on merchandise that is imported. Uh, notably, uh, importations is high in Singapore, Vietnam, Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, including exports. You know. Now, other countries that significantly affected by the outbreak include our trade partners. So most of the significant trade partners of ASEAN are US and the uh, European Union. And these are also the, the region's largest trade investment partners of our respective countries. And they are also affected so much, you know, and the World Trade Organization has estimated that world trade is expected to fall between 13% to 32% in 2020. And this has actually exceeded the decline brought about by the global financial crisis. The global financial crisis that we have uh, state, uh, emanated from the Asian contagion that was in 1997 and thereafter. But the impact or the decline uh, is not comparable uh, with this COVID-19. It's more severe. Now, let's now talk on the supply. No? The supply. What was the impact? Production was disrupted because of the lockdown. Mobility of people, the labor is impaired because they cannot go out from their homes. And there were restrictions in the transportation. So it, most of the countries that had lockdowns uh, impaired, if not uh, stop any public transport because that could mean convergence of people in, in a in close uh, uh, transport and, and therefore that could be a source of uh, contagious also. So what is ADB saying this on this area? Uh, first is that there is one development also. It resulted to a collapse in the oil prices. I mean, cost of oil has gone down uh, mostly because of the demand, uh, low demand. And the low de demand has been caused by the widespread lockdown and the travel bans, no? which have a sharp impact on the economy, especially those dependent on the export of fuel. I understand uh, Indonesia also exports fuel you know, because you have a source of oil. Now, Indonesia's uh, were coal, uh, coal and oil comprise about 25 of your exports, so you're really also affected by this. No? And Malaysia also, because it also exports oil and gas. Brunei, no? who's 90% uh, uh, has, I mean, in the economy is fueled by 90% of its export, no? uh, primarily on crude and natural gas. So you could just imagine how these countries are affected, uh, the economies of these countries are affected because of this development. Now, what else? No? According to uh, the Institute of International Finance, you know, uh, there has been capital outflows, meaning m money going out you know, from the emerging markets. And most of the countries in the ASEAN are considered in the emerging markets, which have totaled nearly $100 billion so far for 2020 alone, you know, with Southeast Asia taking a hit, a sizable hit, you know, because we, we are in the emerging markets. You know. Indonesia has seen an outflow of 8.2 billion in capital by end of March 2020. And uh, this has somehow led to your uh, depreciation of your currency uh, in your rupiah, which has depreciated 14.5% on a year to date uh, basis. So now for the Thai baht and Malaysian ringgit and Singapore dollars, they also depreciated by more than 4% no? uh, in the period March 2 to 19. No? Now, countries reliant on remittances because of the contribution of the overseas foreign workers, such as the Philippines, are also hit hard because there was a decline in remittance. And at the same time, countries uh, where these OFWs work have decided to return all foreign workers. So at present here in the Philippines, I think there are about 14,000 or more, 40,000, OFWs have returned back to the country and even some of them were even the source of uh, transmission of COVID because maybe when they went back here in the country, uh, they already carried the uh, COVID you know, and they were not detected, mostly the asymptomatic cases of COVID, okay? 
Now, talking about uh, demand, okay, I think, um, let me just check, okay. Okay, wait, let's just on demand. No? So there were lower consumption growth and weaker investment growth. That, that is a consequence uh, of all these issues related to supply, knowing that the supply and demand has a direct uh, into the relationship. So there is a negative productivity shock in, in this aspect uh, for our uh, economy here in, in Southeast Asia or in ASEAN. Now, what are the, the policy response you know, in so far as government is concerned? So there has been a huge health spending. You know? uh, some countries would have uh, uh, supported by, uh, what do you call this, providing free testing. Well, I haven't heard really that in Southeast Asia, the governments have been providing free testing, but they do uh, provide testings for maybe for the government workers or for the medical frontliners. And uh, um, there have been support also given to certain local governments who are unable to or could not afford to provide all this health related spending. And uh, on the business side, uh, countries uh, have provided financial or fiscal stimulus. You know, this fiscal stimulus, we would often hear that in, in, in modern countries or the Western countries, such as the United States and the United Kingdom or the European countries. You know, we, we often hear the support. You know? So it is really the call of the government how they want to, to uh, support the economy during this time of crisis. And well, fiscal stimulus has always been identified as one of the resort uh, uh, policy resort uh, to alleviate the impact of uh, a pandemic uh, or a crisis to the economy. And let's see how uh, ADB is telling us on this. No? So many countries have uh, unveiled comprehensive fiscal stimulus packages that actually aim at supporting businesses, particularly small businesses and households. This actually includes uh, cash given to, uh, to the citizens, as a support because during lockdown you are encouraged you are not encouraged to go out and therefore uh, you will have difficulty getting your food and and so forth so some countries uh, that has always been the immediate uh, support given no, to to the citizens no? and that's part of the fiscal stimulus now not all countries are consistent in providing stimulus to support businesses and uh, this is what uh, compounds the the uh, problem among business especially for the small and the small or the micro and small and medium uh, enterprises because they're the first the businesses that is hit first because they cannot continue their business when people cannot go to the place of work because of the lockdown second is that who will patronize their business especially if there are restaurants uh, bars or gyms or, or areas where you know people would converge and therefore there are they are considered as the most hit businesses uh, during times of uh, this pandemic and normally the composition of the stimulus package will vary country by country no so it may take the form of financial subsidies it may take the form of deferral in the payment of tax or exemption as well as increase in direct spending so uh, you would understand uh, when you read the papers or the news as to what the government is doing to your country to support uh, the economy. Now, just to give you an idea how, uh, what was the impact of COVID to the growth forecast, because this will tell us whether, you know, uh, are, is recovery on the horizon or is it, is it something that the, our respective governments is already predicting? So shown on the screen, if you look at the different uh, countries in Asia, Southeast Asia, and uh, this is from uh, uh, a, a source uh, called uh, SCAP, no? where they presented here the different Southeast Asian countries. The, the bar graph uh, represents the forecast made last November 2019, so that's fairly recent, forecast supposedly for 2020. And uh, the recent forecast as, as adjusted by the respective countries done last April 2020 
is be presented by those dots. Okay. So let's say overall, the Southeast Asian countries have, have forecasted earlier an average of 4% uh, growth uh, in GDP. But you look at the, the, uh, the recent forecast is that it's flat. No? And, and country to country, Brunei is going to a recession already. It is already negative uh, from an earlier forecast of maybe one or more than almost two. Uh, Cambodia, look at how a, a huge change from a 6.5 or 7, now it's down to 2. Indonesia, from an original of maybe 5, it has now gone down to almost 2. Uh, this is Laos. Malaysia is now in the, in the recession stage because it's gone negative. Myanmar, Philippines also is just going down as well as uh, recession now in Singapore, Thailand, and Timor-Leste. And Vietnam, well, among all the Southeast Asian countries, actually Vietnam is doing well. No? And, and you have seen that earlier. That he's one of the countries in Vietnam, is one of the countries that has, actually has flattened or even have uh, insignificant number of cases of COVID. So this is where we are. Now, so in terms of employment no, or unemployment, so the forecast of unemployment rate or 2020 by select uh, Southeast Asian countries. No? So since we are prominent, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Philippines, uh, because if you look at the unemployment rate estimated last October 2019, so Indonesia was looking at five, uh, but now in their April 2020 uh, estimate, uh, they foresee that the unemployment rate for 2020 will go up as high as 7.5. So if you look at the, 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 the triangle represent the most recent uh, estimate uh, of unemployment. For Malaysia, likewise, uh, it is projected last October 2019 to be around 3.5. It's now uh, projected at 5%. In case of the Philippines, we had projected in 2019 around five or a little above five. Now we are projecting to have this at uh, higher than six. Now, actually, if you, you, you look at this, this is still quite optimistic because if you look at the, the last estimate made was in April 20, if you look at the COVID cases that we had, <clears throat> The, the, the trajectory that is really quite steep happened in July and August. So you could just imagine how will this look like if we have a more recent uh, estimate, say, let's say August uh, or uh, yeah, August uh, 2020. You know? So uh, this is really a worrisome situation. And uh, as I said, um, we are still, we don't know if we are already in a peak uh, in this pandemic, but still, it is still moving, and and therefore, uh, it somehow gives us a, a a not so good prospect of recovery in the ASEAN region in a very near future. So, I just want to give you the assessment of ADB, and they said that the while the ASEAN economies offer compelling investment prospect, really coming from China, because you know China is a big problem. It has a trade problem with the U.S. A big trading partner. And yes, it's, it's going to reposition. Uh, they are going to exploit businesses in niche industries well established here in Asia. You know? So that's where the, the, the concentration that uh, the ADB is looking at. You know? So ASEAN will remain be, uh, an investment prospect uh, for prominent businesses, but uh, still we, we, it takes uh, to consider the, the, the possibility of this being suppressed because of this development. Now, IMF predicts that the region, Southeast Asian region, to grow by 7.8% in 2021. So to interpret this, they're saying that somehow in 2021, we will bounce back. Uh, I would like to believe that there may, the assumption would be that maybe within the year or early 2021, uh, we will have vaccine already available. Uh, for this COVID because medical practitioners saying that the only thing that can suppress if not contain this COVID crisis is, uh, is that we have the vaccine. So, and that's precisely why most businesses are really stepping up in 
coming out with their vaccine because uh, that should more or less uh, help, no? or that is the, the solution that uh, every country is looking at uh, to address the COVID cases. So if we believe uh, what IMF is predicting, but this is also uh, the, the latest was still uh, around April, that the economy may recover in 2021. No? And, and, and I said earlier, this will be fueled by the acceleration of China-based manufacturers looking to diversify their risk in Asia. No? So let's see. No? But the end uh, assessment of ADB is that for now, we can, we, we don't, we will still see uncertainty in the future, no? Because uh, as I've shown to you earlier, the COVID cases, business recovery is largely based on the prospect of how severe this pandemic will be within in the next months. So if we will still have a worsening condition in the next few months, I guess this can also, you know, uh, delay any prospects of recovery from the initial forecast of about 2021. It may not be at the start of the year. Uh, if we have to believe Trump also, uh, or uh, Trump in saying that or, or other presidents that would say that by December we will have the vaccine and therefore there is a, a positive uh, uh, expectations to come, let's say, in the early or the first half of 2021. But still, the general assessment is that the future is still uncertain. So, so really the... the, the, the 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 challenge among all countries especially in our region is to how to contain these covid cases because you know striking a balance the life of the people against the business or the the income that every uh, citizen should earn is quite a difficult balance to take you know? uh, it, it really depends on also on the policy of government so uh, each and every country would have unique circumstances and governments would decide accordingly. So in general, he would say, I would say that the, I would tend to support that still the future is uncertain. But if there are uh, positive developments that will happen in the next few months or within the, the year, uh, the remaining months of the year, then I guess there is... Uh, there is prospect in seeing a recovery, a start of recovery in 2021, maybe in the second half of the year. Okay. Now, at this point, uh, I would like to entertain if some of you have questions, uh, because uh, you know uh, the next slides that we will cover will now be on uh, internal audit and pandemics. But my reason for giving you a situationer is that for you to be aware of the developments and, uh, you know, uh, the survey of IAA Global uh, among the different stakeholders of internal audit. And one of the disturbing uh, comments was that internal auditors does not seem to understand business. And this is the time that, you know, you really have to understand what's happening because this is affecting your respective uh, employers. I would or not, I, I would like to proceed. The for the uh, is about we should wait. Uh, I've already invited all the participants to chat your question in the chat room or maybe raise hand if anyone have a question or maybe response with the presentation in section one, or maybe we just discuss, just feel comfortable and just discuss uh, how is it the situation in Philippines maybe, and how is it to compare with the situation here in Indonesia? Please, if anyone participant wants to, okay. 
Mr. Hari Setianto, raise hand, President of IIA Indonesia. Please, yeah. uh, Mr. Hari. Yeah, but Dini, I think uh, just follow on to your point that you would like also to know uh, when what happened uh, in Philippines, how the yeah. government responded to this uh, mm -hmm. crisis, for example, because in our case, we have uh, also prepared huge stimulus for our economy. And because of that, we also have to uh, issue new regulation, new, new regulation, new requirement, new policies, mm -hmm. which were created in a very short time, in a few mm -hmm. days, created very short time. And then also we have to alter our state and local government budget also in a very short time, in a significant way. So, I mean, uh, this, what happened in uh, the Philippines and how the, I mean, uh, internal audit, uh, especially government auditor responded also to this uh, demand from the stakeholders. We, we have a similar uh, policy response from government, no? uh, except that, uh, well, the support to the public uh, in the form of cash assistance were given. Uh, I think we had two waves of it. Uh, and in fact, the government has to borrow a lot from ADB and I think from World Bank. Um, this is done in a short period of time, as, as, as you said, no? most of the and budgets have to be adjusted. Uh, the the battle cry of uh, our the president of the Philippines is actually build, build, build. So it was supposed to be an infrastructure-based uh, budget, but because yeah. also of uh, the constraints in you know continuing construction, uh, you are unable to do so because you have constraints in labor, you have the social distancing issue, and, and so forth. No, so some budget have been diverted, but still uh, we had borrow because of that. Now, while there are the, the support given to business to, took the form of, you know, delay in the payment of tax because April 15 is supposedly the payment of the annual income tax. And then, uh, the, so that, well, that was one that was more prominent. And, but there was no fiscal stimulus that supports small and medium sized businesses, you know, because when the lockdown was made, it's like it's total standstill, you know, Everybody was hit. And uh, of course, those who were not able to survive a prolonged lockdown, uh, we started lockdown in March 16. And you could just imagine it's five months already. And uh, there has been no stimulus for or support given to small, what we call as, uh, MSMC, no? micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. And I think this is where... Uh, this can contribute a lot in the unemployment because it is the small and medium-sized businesses that employs, like I said, restaurants. They employ, you know, waiters, you know, they employ you know, many of them. They are labor intensive in the sense that service-oriented businesses are labor intensive. So they are affected so much, And but we have no support for that. I think the model that uh, you have to look at is, I think, UK. UK provided some stimulus or support for their what you call them, micro small medium-sized enterprises because they're really the one that's double hit no and these are the ones that employs many people because if you look at large organic large uh, enterprises they're either automated uh, and and therefore they have a system that does not rely so much maybe on people so they're not as, as severely affected like the small and medium-sized enterprises. So we have similarities, maybe because we're neighbors, but uh, uh, I think what is alarming is the COVID cases that is still uh, increasing. Okay, so are there mm. Yeah, maybe other question? Uh, There's none. Thank you, Mr. Hari, for uh, the question that uh, compare between situation here in Indonesia and in Philippines. And we can see that we have faced a common challenge here. Yeah? This is really a crisis time and it needs a true leaders and uh, true internal auditors that really know 
what happened actually here now. So that's a really good point from Miss Helen that we need to know the situation first and then we we plan for the uh, solution and how to adapt in this challenge. Please, uh, is there any participant wants to say or to want to give any other question? Oh, I see here, Mr. Ferry Iriawan. How frequent policy change by government regarding COVID-19 in Philippines? and how your company adapt to the policy change and what is the role of internal audit to help company adapt to new policy. Please, Miss Helen, uh, yeah. Mr. Ferry is asking about how frequent the policy change in the, from the government Philippines regarding the COVID-19 and how the business needs to adapt with the, the change of the policy. Yeah. Initially, uh, in the early part of the lockdown, so that was around March, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. if, and, if, and, and if my reference would be now the public, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, what do you call this, sessions that the president, uh, where the president talks to the public, you know, and, and release all these policy issues. Uh, at the start, it was like monthly or the first one was two months because that was the first lockdown. Mm -hmm. And then eventually it has become monthly. And then at present, it's like a week or two. Okay. Uh, the most recent change that we had, we, we went, we already were in a general uh, quarantine, uh, co general community quarantine. Now we're again in enhanced in Metro Manila because of mm -hmm. the increased case. The, the, and we're given two weeks you know, for this lockdown. So you could just imagine uh, it has mm -hmm. uh, until it is abated, you know, chances are the government would come out with a policy or any improvement, any changes, like on a two weeks time frame, you know, just just mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, for the public to adapt, you know, because otherwise. Uh, but you know, the more uh, what would be the indicators of weakness, you no, know, in this, you no. Know? If you have a continuing changes or in, in the in the policy, that somehow gives an impression that maybe the problem was not analyzed well at the very start. You know, mm -hmm. uh, our problem is that the one leading the or overseeing the programs for this COVID are not predominantly medical practitioners. You know? uh, supposedly, the health. Uh, uh, group. Uh, if you look at the successful experience of uh, countries, uh, it is the medical uh, experts that lead uh, the programs uh, in abating COVID. Well, in our case, the, the, uh, the body that is leading this includes even uh, military people so or retired uh, military. So somehow the very controversial situation that happened in manila was was about two or three days ago when the association of all medical practitioners issued an appeal to the president about you know going back to this uh, enhanced lockdown because you know having four thousand to five thousand cases a day was really alarming and all the hospitals are already overwhelmed there are more uh, medical staff getting sick and it's like going back to the situation when we had the first peak you know but i think it was not taken well by our president and but, but he he responded by instituting certain changes uh but you know after getting a dressing down <laughs> like the medical groups uh, or the associations were like were given like a dressing down president because of that. But you know, as I said, the leadership is very important in this time of crisis. You know, uh, in times of crisis, this is the time you will see who, who's good and who's not. <laughs> and I think the second question is how is internal audit responding to the crisis? I will tackle that in the next. Uh, yes, yeah, in the next section. And. Uh, it is really very important that everyone should be aware of what's happening because your mm -hmm. contribution 
uh, especially if you're working and you're still in an organization that is also besieged with all these problems, uh, mm -hmm. the time where you have to show your value. Yes. <laughs> otherwise, we will be part of the unemployment rate. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> okay. I think that is the answer from Miss Helen for the Mr. Ferry area one question. Now we have another question and respond, Miss Helen. This is from Mr. Taufik Supriyadi. He is my senior in the Audit Board of the Republic of Indonesia. And the question is and respond, yeah, build the role of an effective internal auditors in pandemic situation cannot be separated from the application of good corporate governance in the organization overall. Okay, the principles of good corporate governance, such as fairness, independency, transparency, accountability, and responsibility in an effort to improve professionalism and the welfare of shareholders without ignoring stakeholder interest. Each report weakness in internal control or risk control effectiveness of the Supreme Audit Institution should be immediately followed up by the board of member and executive officer uh, related. And the problem is that we might be at the lower management level where our superior show no concern of the situation and this may hinder us to adapt in the recovery of the organization business. The question is, how can we deal with this problem? Because, you know, the, the condition impact of COVID-19 make us lower management level and sometimes our superior give no concern about the situation. They may be only rich for the uh, result of the work. Maybe yeah. you have any suggestion for Mr. Taufik, Ms. Helen? I, 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 yeah, so you're coming from the public sector. You know, so yes. I really yeah. sympathize, you know, if you have such superior, you know, who's, who's not, uh, I would say, sensitive to what's happening around, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, this can affect anyone in the organization and getting involved is something that you know each and everyone would like to be you know so i guess the the reality is that how do we educate our boss you know how how, how do we how do we make him understand what we you know especially if you are not in that level you no know? i mean you're you're down there you no know? so i i guess the the first thing to understand is what's the culture in the organization does your boss uh is receptive in you know conversations such as you know you know like you know this is what i i i did before when i was in the corporation no because i just retired and and uh i've been attending a lot of governance seminar because i was at the same time uh in a concurrent capacity given the position of the compliance officer then you know, in a very short period because the, the audit committee wanted an independent person leading the compliance on mm -hmm. corporate governance and we have identified i have conveyed to the audit com that we really have to work on the president and the ceo because he it's one person you know because yeah. he's not yet attuned to you know what good governance really uh required and this is what happened. Every time I attend a, a session like this or any uh, briefings or seminars, mm -hmm. uh, I try to find time to echo this to my boss. Okay, So it's like a subtle way of educating. And then I said, I, I said it in a, in a very casual way. Say, uh, let's say we happen to, I happen to report something to him and then I will segue by saying, by the way, sir, I, I attended uh, this session and it was very, very informative. And, you know, I, I, I this is what they did. You know, this company, this is how they do it, you know. And this is, and, you know, when I think about it, it can be done in our company. You know, you know it's it's like a conversation. Uh, you're just talking. You're, you're not teaching. You're not uh, dictating. It was like just sharing a story of what you learned from that session. And, and somehow... 
and somehow it yeah it, no, Miss Helen it slowly influenced it has slowly influenced my boss then or the CEO then and mm -hmm. uh, by just this converse conversation like his response would be like this well why don't you check it if it's something that is good for us you know yeah. why uh, you know it started with that kind of conversation and then on another time and I said you know sir uh this is what this com listed company is doing. And this is that you do. And I realized in our case, we're, we're not doing this. And, and if we do this, this is... And then, you know, the boss will say, why don't you initiate that? And, you know, talk to like yeah. this. And talk to like this. So you see the one way of... But you have to understand the culture because there are organizations or there are bosses that don't want to be dictated the fund. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So you have to be sensitive. If it's not your boss, then find another route. Maybe look for another person who can influence him or who can influence her. You know, some, you know, it, sometimes the auditors has to be creative. You know, <laughs> so hard. You know, to be in an or you are so you know you want to yeah. do you, know, you want to help you want to you know this is very good for your organization, but you know the stumbling block is your boss is not responding. It's like dead ma. No, so it's you have to find some ways now. After trying many ways and it's not, it's not uh, working. Working, I have one policy in life: if you cannot, if you cannot help them, leave them. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is not the option. That's not the option for, for most of us, you know. So yes. try and try, try and try. Okay, thank you for the suggestion, Miss Helen. Okay, Mr. Taufik, I hope uh, the answer can fulfill uh, your question. So, Ms. Helen suggests uh, to, you know, first know your culture in the organization and then try to talk with the CEO or the president and in a casual, in informal way. And maybe if we cannot uh, talk to them, maybe we can say to another person, that uh, important and can influence our CEO or our president. I think that's uh, the summarize of Miss Helen's suggestion. And actually, it's almost 45 minutes for the section one. Uh, for the other question from Mr. Eddie Mulia, is about uh, internal audit roles. So maybe it's relevant for uh, presentation in section two and three, Miss Helen. Maybe, uh, Mr. Echo, we can continue with the pulling. Uh, yeah, let me just yeah. start with the, the second, and, and anyway, you will be advised uh, whether the polling will start. Okay, so okay. now let's go to the second section, you know, the internal mm -hmm. audit of the pandemic. So, this will really talk about how internal audit is responding to the, the crisis. You know? yeah. Now, <clears throat> well, let's have the first poll. No? Mm -hmm. uh, it's Prepare for this. So when a pandemic occurs, does the mandate of internal audit change or will not change? No? So the question here is the, the mandate of internal audit will not change. Is this true or this is false? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, the polling is still happening. True and false, like you know, in the <laughs> similar position, fifty to fifty. So maybe we can see until the end, which is the majority question answer answer for this poll. Okay, I think one minute is enough. I will end the polling. Okay. Okay. So majority or fifty-seven percent will not change, and uh, yeah. I agree with you. No. Uh, mm -hmm. Wait, let me so. So it the, the reason is that whatever crisis you are in, your mandate will remain. 
what what will change most likely would be your plan your procedures and and the methods that you're going to use but your mandate will still be the same okay you provide uh, the services for your stakeholders and it's essentially there are three major or two major classification of the services you're providing assurance and providing mm -hmm. consulting or advisory services it will not change the mandate will not change okay so it's good that majority uh, had the right answer so let's now proceed now uh, so when the pandemic occurred you know, what was the what are the usual responses of internal audit to pandemic risk now first is to suspend internal audit plan the original plan and mm -hmm. that's the most sensible thing to do you know because when you, you develop your plan let's say a year before it was on the assumption that these are the conditions uh, of the company or the organization uh, as, as you have projected. So when the, 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 the conditions have changed, there's a need to review and suspend the plan and, and, and adjust accordingly, uh, of course, in, in consultation with your stakeholders, so primarily your audit com and at the same time management or the reverse. The order should be with management first then mm -hmm. the audit committee. Then you have to identify the priority issues. Uh, normally, this is where you, in the internal auditors, especially the CAE, should be in touch with the top management uh, because you have to understand the needs and, and requirements of the company in the light of this crisis. And you have to provide assistance as, as, as important as it is because this is where your occasion to really make sure that you are providing value uh, to the organization so you help uh, so the priority will be based on what help is needed by the organization sometimes uh, you will take the business continuity role and uh, not necessarily leading it but take uh, a support role in the business continuity activities of the organization since that's the primordial concern of every company in crisis now the to a certain extent, most of the, the role that the internal audit would be to be a real-time control advisor. Why? Because there might be some instances where certain controls will have to be sacrificed. Now, this is where the cost-benefit is, no? Either because you have limited, the company have limited manpower, that some controls may have to be sacrificed, whether mm -hmm. temporarily or permanently. So this is the occasion where the auditors are actually consulted as to the implication of, of, of this particular initiatives. You know? So it can serve also as a, a, a monitoring to, con, uh, to monitor controls, especially if there are uh, areas that have been sacrificed and therefore they would like, management would like that there would be somebody that would be checking this from time to time, just sure that there is no uh, uh, prolonged uh, problems that, uh, that may occur. No? Now, to some extent, you know, the perception would be you're taking like the internal audit hat, no? It's like you're, you're not the, the person that will be watching or looking over their work, but rather uh, taking an active role in performing solutions for the company. Now, uh, the mm -hmm. other would be provide any alternative service that may be required by management. Now, normally the audit committee will understand uh, uh, if you are given other roles, uh, but the requirement is for the CAE to apprise the audit committee what different roles are you going to assume. In some instances, like for example, uh, some officers are, uh, are unable to go to work or are, are incapacitated or just died because of COVID, that the auditor may be given assignment, like, can you be the chief risk officer in the meantime, you know, can you be this like this? Uh, on a temporary basis, I guess that's reasonable. You know? Now, what are the roles of internal audit in a crisis? So the typical uh, role that is given is really has something to do with uh, the business continuity management. It can be BCM or it can be BCP. No? How do you distinguish both? No? So BCM would really take more on prolonged uh, disruptions. No? So usually when you develop your BCM, you take into consideration what are the, the events that could be catastrophic for the organization and therefore you develop a plan for that. Now BCP would really more of a temporary disruption or a, a short a, a crisis 
then therefore, uh, whatever it is that the company has in terms of their maturity in the BCM uh, landscape, uh, you are often than not auditors are surely given this role no? to check whether it is complete and it is uh, 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 sufficient for the needs of, of the company as of that time because nobody anticipated this pandemic. This is really new to us. No? It, yes. in, our, in my lifetime, I could not remember. The SARS, I, I hardly felt it because we were not mm -hmm. so much affected. But the, if you look at the magnitude like the Spanish flu that they said, that was mm -hmm. thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago. So in our lifetime, we never experienced this. No? So in terms of completeness, in terms of maturity, in terms of appropriateness based on the organization's risk appetite or tolerance. So this is where uh, somehow you uh, in, internal auditors take an active role and from time to time will really be providing advice and do some test and, and, and uh, to assure you know, management and the board of how are we responding to how the organization is responding to the crisis. The other role that you take is that if you do risk assessment for planning purposes only or for during your engagement uh, introduction, uh, during crisis, there will be more frequent business risk assessment needed by the organization because you know you don't know how it is going to progress you know? like this covid case we never thought that uh, we will reach this point where we are already having cases like in the levels of three or four or five thousand you know we thought all the while we had our peaked already around april but surprisingly this time it has really uh, gone a steep uh, increase you no know? now another one uh, role that would be uh, more uh, frequent also would be program <laughs> project reviews you know so uh, while this can be partly done in cooperation with uh, the line organization uh, in times of crisis you know uh, management would prefer an independent assessment or review coming from an objective body like the internal audit you no know? so this is one of the areas where uh, internal audit roles, uh, the, the uh, internal audit have roles in a crisis. And another one would be perform advisory service, which is supposed to be a given, but there will be more frequent requests for advice on this because uh, the, the mindset of management is that you are not attached or you are not involved in the direct process. So you may have a clear view from the outside on what is happening and you will the, the expectation is that you will not be biased no? these are the times in, in times of crisis these are the times that management would welcome you know unpleasant news you know or or difficult news because this is reality now no? if you're not aware of of reality of what's happening and still in a denial stage uh, that that spells problems in the organization now, in terms of uh, approach, uh, what is surfacing uh, during crisis is that there will be now more remote auditing. Well, it is logical in the sense that since uh, you are constrained from going out of your home or there will be cer certain restrictions, uh, remote auditing is, is, has become more prominent uh, at, at, during crisis, especially for this pandemic that we have. And so, uh, I put a sign like this. It doesn't mean that you, you, you do away with risk base. Still, there's risk base, but there is now more remote auditing. And how is this done? No? So, remote audit is a audit that is performed, except that you use. Sorry, okay. Yeah. Okay. So remote auditing is exactly the same as the usual audit, except that we use the electronic means to remotely obtain audit evidence. Now, some would be seamless uh, electronic access, but some would do it this way, which I know from, because I tried to ask uh, a, a friend who is in the public sector here in the Philippines, maybe it's different from different for Indonesia, but I asked them, how do you do your remote auditing? Uh, considering that uh, you may have constraints, your, let's say your internet at your end or internet at the end of the office or 
uh, there is no uh, your system in the office is not not uh, automated and therefore there's a certain degree of manual in the procedures so they said uh, part of the remote uh, process remote auditing process for those that are, that are in manual systems is that uh, at least a day in a week they go to the office and you know uh, collect data that they need or files or uh, a, a, a volume of files or, or volume of data and put it in their laptop and then that and then they would do their work at home no? So in the, the use of technology to query audit work and in a remote auditing setup would really require that uh, that the the auditor at a certain point may you know may or may not use may not be physically present in the location. The idea of uh, remote auditing is you need not be in the uh, audit location. No? Now the remote techniques in the location are some. The challenges that is often encountered is that the remote techniques in the location are difficult to access. You know, there are areas that are have weak internet uh, access, so uh, that has always been a constraint in many countries. No? Well, especially in the Philippines, you know, uh, our internet is not as fast as as as, as uh, has been no, for for the existing telcos. But there are now many providers. Uh, uh, of, of, of internet that gives you a, a, a better uh, access or a service. Uh, in my case, like now, no, I, I, I'm actually in the, in the condo of my son who works from home because we have a corporate uh, internet here, which is more reliable compared to the internet that I have in our home. So that would be the, the continuing challenge for remote auditing. Now, the challenge is that you have to ensure when you do a remote audit is that you have to ensure the feasibility of the technology that you're going to use. So meaning in internet or what, no? And then that you have to sure, ensure also that you're able to protect the confidentiality or the security of the data that you bring along or that you bring to your home to work on, you know? Uh, just to give you an example, my son worked for a very sensitive company, and uh, when his uh, monitors were and, and computer was brought at home, shield for the screen such that if somebody stays near you, they cannot see what's in the screen. Something to that effect, you know. So they're very conscious on the security and confidentiality of the information that can be seen on the screen of me. So audit report should also clearly state the extent use of technology. So meaning when you do make a report of a, a, a project uh, where you did a remote audit, it, it is very important to highlight if there were certain constraints, no? Uh, because uh, it is possible that, you know, that uh, it may be remote, but there is a possibility that there are data that may have been lost or there are data that has been uh, missing. So it's important that you have to uh, indicate in the report the extent use of the technology or the technology that is being used, no? especially if there are processing done. Now, the audit report also should include uh, the processes that have not been audited. So in maybe in the initial program, you have stated that you're going to cover this sub process, but because you had to do remote auditing, uh, there are certain areas that you are unable to audit and that should be stated also in the report. Okay, now, what are the remote auditing tools? You know, just to give you an example, one would be the virtual meeting tool, meaning you can uh, interview your uh, specific persons that supposedly you will interview and you we had the possibility of doing a face-to-face -face interview so you can either call them using the phone and, and use a virtual meeting tool there are many virtual meeting tools like what we have right now the zoom uh, there are many other tools uh, available so that is one of your tool no a virtual meeting tool no? for your interviews or for your follow-up verification or status. Now, repository of documents. No, so if uh, the date a certain database is maintained at the office and you are allowed to remotely access from this, so that that whether it's a scanned document or it's uh, uh, a 
a data in the form of text, uh, that's one of the, the remote auditing tools that you can uh, also use. Scheduling, no? so calendars, you can also, uh, if, 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 you, uh, if your system allows you to view calendars uh, and, and, and schedules of people that you want to audit uh, or you want to check whether indeed there was an activity on this date and that, uh, that could be another remote auditing tool. No? Now, survey and polling. By the way, uh, survey and polling is a very powerful uh, audit uh, tool, no? uh, especially uh, if it, let's say, getting a, a sense of uh, or pulse of the employees. I remember um, we when we audited the whistleblowing uh, process or system of our company before, um, then the part of the audit was to check whether the employees are aware that this is facility is present and is available for them. The second is we wanted to know whether they understood what are the, the rules uh, in availing it and when do they avail it and what are the commitments of the company to protect them from retaliation. So, so we did actually a survey among the employees uh, using the, the email uh, facility um, of the company. Now for those employees who have no email because the nature of their work does not require them to have a computer, we, we did uh, a polling in terms of you, by using uh, papers. No? But let's say in this pandemic, uh, you can do a, a, a segment uh, polling uh, using the, let's say, uh, the, the, the email. No? So there are a lot of things that you can really process uh, for survey. And, and the result of this is very powerful because this is coming from third parties, you know? okay? Managing tasks, you know, you can do this also because you have your calendar. If it's, uh, you can remotely uh, make invitations uh, to, to your uh, audities as well as also manage the tasks, your to-dos you know, in the system. Managing meetings, uh, inventory control. Uh, this is possible if you are able to have access uh, of the, or the databases in your company remotely. And that could be uh, a remote auditing tool also. And of course, the different CAATs, no? the computer-aided auditing tools that is available. Uh, this, this, this is really advisable if you have a voluminous files to process. No? So I just want to share with you the results of survey, the 2020 very recent survey of the IIA Global Audit Executive Center. And uh, I took the portion where the, uh, the respondents is coming from Asia, okay? The pandemic's impact and the year ahead for the internal auditor, no? so internal audit, and this would give us a sense of uh, how is it affecting uh, internal audit in Asia. No, okay. Now the these were the questions. No, that uh, I, I I lifted uh, that is more or less uh, useful for us. No, so which which employee focus actions has your organization taken in response to COVID? No, so employee focus actions. So we look at the remote management. So ninety six percent of almost all said that there's remote work arrangements being done. No? And then second to that is that there, there have been change in the, or there have been new policies for employee health and safety, of course, the, the social distancing, wearing masks and, and so forth, no? and working from home because of, of, of this pandemic. No? And then the next highest is that travels were restricted. Actually, if you look at the global, uh, global statistics, uh, they said uh, travel has really cut uh, largely uh, in their budget no? because of the because also of the travel restrictions of the of the lockdown. Then uh, there were also more communication to the key employees. So there had been strategy for this, and that uh, new technology for remote work and related security has been top no? for this. No? So okay. And so, by the way, there is also here travel eliminated because that really seems to be logical. The next question is that what are which employee focus action has your organization taken in response to 
the COVID, so meaning impact to the employee. No? So uh, generally in Asia, staffing was not affected. No? So eight, there's 82%. However, there is also uh, a noted decrease normally for temporary employees or for the contractual employees. Or for the global uh, statistic, they said this refers also to the outsource uh, internal audit uh, resource. No? So well, well, there was also a reduction of 4%. You know, uh, uh, this is very challenging to us. So we, we hope this, this does not happen to most of uh, internal audit organizations. And I'd like to speculate that what could be the reason for uh, reducing employees, especially if they're already in a permanent status. And uh, the common uh, response is that maybe the organization doesn't see value in what you're doing. So this is really a challenge for, for internal auditors to prove your value, okay? Now, has, how has your audit plan changed as a result of COVID? So earlier we said that there's a need to reassess. No? So look at what they said. So they discontinued or reduced the scope for some audit engagements. So 68%. And some have even canceled audit engagements. So 59%. And, and as I said earlier, uh, the reason for that is because the, the original plan that was approved by the audit committee was in a different circumstance or a different condition. So this is logical that for some, if not for most, that there are really some of the plan engagements that are either reduced or the scope is reduced or even canceled and replaced to a new. No? And then, but there are new audit engagements that are now focused on the pan impact of pandemic to the organization, like the BCM, BCP, and, 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 and the likes. HR related, you know, how are we, uh, how, how robust the company is able to put in place uh, uh, new policies that has some to Then another is that some of the staff are redirected to do non-audit work. Some would even be related to uh, uh, the the uh, operations or management. Now, oftentimes than not, if ever there are certain audit stuff that is redirected, these are not the supervisory level type. No, meaning they have more manpower to do it, and they believe that uh, the auditors are very keen or very sharp in doing this, but not involved in the strategic uh, uh, level side. No, because. Uh, the resource, uh, the, the, the potential uh, threat on independence can be an issue. You know? So I, I would believe that these are the ranks, no? the, the low level. Now, the next question, uh, how has your internal audit staffing changed as a result in COVID? And, uh, uh, oh my, my God, I think I, I, uh, how would how's your internal audit budget change in the short term as a result of COVID? So let's see how the budgets have changed. So the 45% says it's almost the same. So almost half of the respondents have say. But if you look at the impact on the budget, if you look at it, decrease slightly, decrease significantly, is, is, is constitute almost the same as status the same. So I guess it, we cannot conclude by saying that the budget of internal audit has not affected. It has affected. No? Uh, the reason being is that across the board, the company would say or come up with a directive that, you know, no travel. So automatically your budget for travel will be reduced. No training, you know, external training. So, so somehow it can really impact on the budget, including that of internal audits budget. No? What else? No? Uh, which employee focused actions has your organization taken in response to the COVID? No? So employee focused actions. So uh, updated the audit plan. Uh, that has been a significant activity. More a review of the risk assessment as well as in identifying emerging risks. So when you are in a crisis, uh, management would immediately say, 
oh, what is again going to happen? We want to be prepared, you know. So therefore, uh, the the identification of emerging risk, no, as an associated risk probably of the pandemic, is very important uh, to the management and of course to the board. That's why internal audit being perceived always as risk uh, experts, you know, uh, that the internal audit will be top to to help the organization in this aspect. No? Also recommend remedial action plans, uh, remedial remediation plans. Uh, internal audit may be top to really provide remediation plans to address some of the risks that have been identified. Okay. Now, how is your audit effort in the following areas? And there's many areas that change as a result of the COVID. No? So this is like a busy slide that will tell you that uh, where, where uh, activities of internal audit increase significantly. So if you look at, you know, so this is a range from the highest to lowest, where internal audit significantly, uh, involvement of internal audit increase significantly. So first is business continuity planning or management. No? It has taken, it has in 46% of the respondents has said it has increased their involvement significantly. Then followed uh, by uh, health and safety. This one, no? health and safety, significant involvement. No? Then followed by both cybersecurity and IT. Uh, why? Because we are now in the age of uh, dependent on the electronic medium of communication and uh, uh, tapping uh, of, of gathering data and securing data. And therefore, the threat of cybersecurity is very important you know so this is where audit is also asked to get really much involved no? then last i think for this what is your level of concern about the long-term viability of your organization as a result of covid so uh, you know this is what keeps everyone awake at night you know in this pandemic many people had mental health problems anxieties depression because of the concern of whether your companies that employs you is able to continue business and therefore your own respective uh, you know uh, income is also at stake and, and therefore this is uh, so for auditors uh, in, in Asia it says that 34 percent are moderately concerned no, about the long-term viability maybe uh, the, most of the respondents in this area are, uh, are in a more secured business and thus uh, uh, they, they are just moderately concerned and including those who are slightly concerned. But there are uh, about 40% uh, no, of the respondents, 27 for very concerned and 30% extremely concerned that is being affected uh, by this COVID-19. So they may be in businesses or they may be in organizations that have been severely affected by uh, the COVID and therefore have a, a, a serious concern on its viability. And it's, it's, it's important also to note, now just for you know, knowledge, you know, uh, that there are also businesses that will thrive in this pandemic. You could just imagine the telco, uh, no, the one that provides internet, might be making a killing really during this time. You know? The pharmaceutical companies, you know, have you experienced that there were times in the early part of the pandemic when everybody's cramming for vitamins, you know, to boost your immune system and you could hardly even get getting an alcohol and in all those, those uh, uh, things, you know, so that will come to your mind, which we, what, what businesses will really thrive in COVID in pandemic times, pharmaceutical, the technology, the the uh, the, the 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 telcos the hospitals and so forth no so th this is very interesting to note that uh what if ever you are in those organizations you're so you're quite secure okay so at this point uh, i just want to uh, stop by first asking also if there are questions that you would like to to raise no this is the second session so hardini uh okay. if there are people yeah. who as questions, I, I would be glad to answer. Yeah, thank you, Miss Helen. Is it already phase two and three of your presentation, Miss? This is phase two. Um, oh, still phase two, yeah? 
Yes, we just okay. want to Okay. Uh, do you have, uh, do you need a minute to uh, take a drink first or something, Miss Helen? Even also for the participants, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like Maybe I... We have, have a five-minute jingle break or, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. We will make this five minutes break for Miss Helen to take a rest first and all the participants. And Mr. Echo, maybe you can help me to present CV of Miss Helen. I'm so sorry before because in the early or the beginning of our webinar, I have uh, internet trouble in my internet. So I haven't explained the CV of Miss Helen. Maybe Mr. Echo can help me to screen share. Yes. So in our five minutes break, all the participants, uh, please give me permissions to explain or to present CV of Miss Helen T. De Guzman, CIA, CRMA, CPA, MBA, and FICD as our speaker today. So Miss Helen is the former first vice president and chief audit executive in the of the Manila Electric Company or Meralco, a publicly leased company, and she was the president of IIA Philippines in 2006 and president of the Asian Confederation of Institute of Internal Auditors or ICIIA in 2015. In addition, she was actively involved in various committees in the IAP or ACIIA since 2003 and 2008, respectively. And after her retirement from Meralco in late 2018, Miss Helen has taken active role in pursuing her advocacy work for internal audit and corporate governance through IIAP and the Institute of Corporate Directors, ICD Philippines. So, Miss Helen serve as one of IIAP resource person for briefing boards and audit committees of various companies. And she also serve as a teaching fellow of ICD for its corporate governance seminars and briefing specializing in audit. And currently, Ms. Helen is also an independent director of publicly list company, a board chair, and an audit committee advisor of reportable condition. So she also leads as a chairperson of the board diversity and inclusion committee of ICD and having completed the woman on board succeeding as a corporate director program of the Harvard Business School batch in 2006, uh, 2017. Okay, that is the brief of uh, CV Miss Helen. <laughs> So we are really, really uh, Thank you, Mr. Echo. Maybe we can Asia maybe to fill our five minutes break. Okay, Miss Helen. Yeah, I just shared. Yeah. Okay. So can you now see the screen? Yes. Okay, so and I proceed. So now the third segment of, uh, do we have any question or we can proceed first with this? Uh, Actually, Ms. Helen, there are some questions already come in, in the chat room. Okay, would you want to do? You would you want Hardini to, to? Are you willing to answer it now? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want the Q&A now or after the phase three? We have three questions actually okay. already come in. Okay, yeah. So first question is from Mr. Eddie Mulia. The question is, in this pandemic situation, internal auditor need to prefer consulting or assurance services? Because if we provide assurance services, there is a potential hazard in the pandemic. So, 
composition between assurance and consulting in crisis time is Helen. Okay. Is so if you if you are asking for the ratio because the ideal ratio of uh, mm -hmm. our work uh, in in normal time you know, in the in the normal times would be there will be greater uh, weight for assurance than consulting or than advisory. Uh, it really depends on yeah. the circumstances of every company. Um, of course, uh, the audit committee uh, will rely more on what assurance we are able to provide. No? And even for management, th there might be certain areas that before does not seem to be their concern, but now it's their concern. So there is really no hard and fast rule as to whether at this time of uh, pandemics or crisis, we will have more advising uh, uh, what they call uh, services than assurance. I still believe that uh, uh, considering that there is now a way of auditing, you know, it might not be as, as, as big as we used to be because of the constraint in the pandemic, but still there will be certain assurance uh, activities that will be feasible for internal audit to do. Uh, take note also that in terms of time, uh, if before we have 100 hours, let's say, for audit time, uh, during the pandemic, there were many times where we are not working uh, because we are not wired, we, are not, uh, we do not do work at home and, and so forth. So the time itself the, the, is, is already li limited. And so the question is that, uh, will management use most of your time for advisory or for, 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 for assurance? I guess your involvement, uh, if, if for example, you are asked to get involved uh, in BCM or in BCP, uh, mm -hmm. is, it, is it more of an advisory role or is it more of an assurance role? I guess there is a certain balance. Uh, for the management to ask you to get involved in BCM or BCP, it is really also wanting to get your assurance, you know, that everything is working well, you know, that we are able to see. And uh, if, if, if you now can say, we can now say that it seems like there is now a thin line between advisory and assurance, you know. But I guess being an auditor, the mindset of, uh, of the management and of course the board would always be because you are an independent person, you are not biased, you are not, it is still an assurance mindset that is in their mind. So it, it's true that, you know, the, there has been, uh, there would be more or less in line between the advisory and assurance, but I guess the more value that is being looked at by management is really be more of your assurance rather than on the advisory. Because remember, whatever you provide or suggest to management, it is still their decision that will matter. They're the ones that are going to decide. So your advice can be taken and not taken while your assurance is more valuable to them. Thank you, Ms. Helen, for uh, the answer. I hope Mr. Eddie Mulia feel it uh, or if he'll feel his question. I think the question from Mr. Eddie Mulia is similar with the question from Mr. Juventius Bagus Sindhu Wasita. He is uh, asking how IA or internal auditor can conducting consulting function in all of the uncertainty that we face today. But I think it's already answered by Ms. Helen. And the second question from Mr. Saiful from BP Jam Sostek, our uh, company in Indonesia. Is society in Philippines also support the government policy, Ms. Helen? Actually, it's related with the phase one of, of your presentation. Uh, so you're asking if the government also provides support to audit? No, no sorry. I mean, uh, the question actually related with the phase one of your presentation. Okay. About the situation okay. in Philippines and also in Southeast Asia. And Mr. Saiful is asking if Philippines society the government policy when you in say the COVID nineteen, you say society referring to the institute or the people, the people. Yeah, I, I the guess people of Philippines. Yeah, people yeah. Of Philippines. 
wh whatever country, you know, you have yeah. no choice. <laughs> no choice. In, in, in a crisis and, and, and pandemic times, we have no yeah. choice. Yeah. Because so, our, our, in our case, may be unique because our president seems to always take a military or a police uh, uh, response. Like yeah. you know, when yeah. when the lockdown was introduced, the first was 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 uh, decided upon. The first instruction was, if you are do not follow, you will be jailed. You know, yeah. there is no choice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I guess that is also applicable in other countries. Yeah, yeah. and needs to be in Indonesia too. Okay, Miss Helen, I think there's only three questions in this uh, session for Q&A. Uh, maybe you can continue your presentation in phase three, Miss Helen. Yes, so the third uh, section now is where you wanted to ask, you know, internal audit roles under the new normal to business recovery. So when I say new normal, I'm telling you, what we're doing now will never go back, no? If ever there will be change, uh, this seems to be now the new normal. Most businesses would say, you know, when people has already adapted to this way of doing things, to this way of, this is now the normal. No? And, and, and uh, uh, I would, I, I am so, I'm not so optimistic that there's something that we can go back. Like for example, people now uh, would prefer or would tend to do work at home and it has been made possible. So even companies are already entertaining the ideas, you know, there are people that you can work at home, you know, and, uh, you know, remote uh, working in a remote setup is, is feasible, you know, and those things that uh, would say, I would believe that eventually uh, people will embrace it and will adapt to it and it will now become the new normal. So in the case of, uh, I know, I'd like to highlight when I, I watched this, uh, I've read this COVID-19 implications for business. And there's a, there's a quote that I wanted to share with you. It says, the econom economic recovery really depends on the return of the consumer. You know? But shopping will never be the same. You know? We may go back to what we used to when we are no longer under the lockdown setup, but it will never be the same again. Yeah? So that's what I'm emphasizing on the, the new normal that uh, it, uh, the, the only thing that will really uh, uh, contribute to the return of our or to our, our recovery from where we are now is really that business activity will flourish again when we have more customers. So I advise you, you know, if you have a chance to buy, buy, spend, if you have money, of course, but uh, if you are... Uh, not so uh, if you have problems with it try to conserve it of course you know you still need to perk the business so that the economy will not you know really flatten down okay so now going back now to the approach uh, early on we said we have risk base and then what is flourishing is the remote auditing under the new normal or under the, you know, with the developments or the transformation to the digital state, to the uh, digitalization, uh, when people are now relying, relying on technology, the agile auditing has come to surface. Uh, and I would like you to have a first an overview of what does agile really means, you know, because uh, there are many instances where we hear this, no, well, being agile and so forth. And what does agile auditing really mean? So I'd like to to uh, play you a, a, just a, a short break, a short. Hello, I'm Mark. I help organizations write software more efficiently, and often this means helping teams understand what it means to develop in an agile way. In this video, we're going to answer the question, what is agile? And just as important, we'll discuss what agile is not. Many things get called agile, especially by people who are trying to sell you something. If you ask the makers of paper products, they will tell you that to be agile, you need to write your user stories on the sticky note cards that they just happen to sell. 
If you ask a consultant, you'll likely hear that it's a methodology for developing software that your organization can learn if you buy their services. And if you talk to the makers of orthopedic shoes, you'll be told that the key to being agile is meetings where everyone stands up. So the more comfortable your shoes, the more agile your team. The actual definition of agile is found in the Agile Manifesto. The manifesto makes it clear that Agile isn't a methodology. It isn't a specific way of doing software development. It isn't a framework or a process. In fact, most of the things that are marketed as Agile tend to miss the point of what Agile actually is. Agile is a set of values and principles. Okay, so what does Agile Internal Audit Network uh, to shift uh, the mindset? Uh, let me just wait. Uh, I think I have, okay, no, okay. So what does Agile Internal Audit really means and what are the methods that work to shift internal auditors' mindset and processes by pursuing the following? Wait. Uh, the Agile Internal Audit really aims for a clear outcomes. Now, when you do an Agile Internal Audit, uh, you rather than by, uh, for example, you know, you, you, when you, the usual audit under normal times is that you have an open-ended reviews, meaning you do not uh, uh, imagine what will happen, what will be the outcome of the audit. But more or less, the, the idea is that you do the procedures after your risk assessment, you, you, def, you, you, you develop the procedures, and in the process, the result, you, you come up with the findings. But in but the reality is that if if the normal way of doing the audit is such, and there is no findings, uh, the problem of some auditors is that they continue to do the procedures in the hope that there is a finding, you know. But internal, uh, but the agile internal audit uh, requires that you know you have to first have an hypothesis, and your mindset should be such that. Your, your, your mission is to either confirm or disprove the hypothesis. No? So that's a, uh, a, this like a mindset shift. No? And in that way, the, the audit or, or the project targets and outcome will guide you where to focus on because you, are, you know more or less what is your objective to prove whether the hypothesis that you have in mind is true or not. No? So, Agile audit would tend to really pursue a clearer outcomes, more definitive rather than do the procedure and hope there's a finding. You know? The other one is that the agile internal audit would also require increased engagement. You know? Increased engagement in the sense that while we would like to maintain your objectivity, you need to collaborate with your stakeholders. Um, well, as we have seen the transformation of internal auditors, we are asked actually to engage, you know, our stakeholders, and that includes management, particularly the president, the CEO, and the other chiefs in the organization, and of course, audit, audit, the audit committee. Now, the, the increased engagement that, that is highly focused in, 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 inter, in the agile internal audit is for some a mindset shift also, because uh, you would realize that there might be certain engagement that does not require engaging the officers because you do not let especially for fraud or any in investigative work you don't have to uh, engage some uh, uh, stakeholders because you don't want that uh, it might preempt you know your findings and so forth but here uh, in, in the agile internal audit method uh, it would really require an increased engagement because this helps identify the needed resources and where to focus on your work. The factors that will determine the business performance and the value. Take note, if you, you engage your stakeholders and you understand their concern, you are able to test your hypothesis as you engage them, then you would know how to go about the audit to strategize such that you're able to provide value. Remember, just let's put an example. You engage the president. You have 
uh, based on your plan and your risk assessment, this is what you intend to audit or to cover. And once when you engage the president, uh, you somehow mentioned that in your risk assessment, uh, this is one of the high risk areas and therefore you would like to cover uh, this specific scope of work. And uh, in engaging him, you, you somehow obtain his views on it and he says something like, you know, uh, if you ask me, this is more important, this, this another one is more important, but you know, it's, it's still good to do that. But it, it's giving you a signal as to uh, what he thinks is more valuable to them. Now, in your case, no, there could be some dilemma uh, to some auditors in saying, is this officer, is this president trying to dictate to me what to do so that I will not be able to uncover something in this area that uh, I, I found that there is a high risk uh, area. So this is where judgment has to be made by the, by the auditor. In maybe if it is done by a, 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 a low level person, you have to uh, communicate with your supervisor or your CAE as to, to your thoughts about it based on the input that you have gathered from the officers that you engage with. So really more than ever than regular uh, audit method, there should be an increased engagement in the agile. Uh, why, why, why the need for increased engagement? Because there are, the problem in certain audits is that there are certain developments that auditors are not privy of. And sometimes it's so embarrassing that when you present your report and then the, the officer will, or the, the head would tell you, uh, one of your auditee will tell you, you know, we, this is what we have been done already. This is what we're doing and, and so forth. You know? and, and, so, and, and sometimes uh, engaging the president may even give you more valuable inputs that even your auditee or the managers that you're auditing is not even aware of. And his inputs would be very valuable in your assessment as to whether you proceed in this path or in this, in this method or in this way. No? So increased engagement is very valuable. What else? No? Uh, improved documentation. In, instead of feeling the need to explain every step of the way, you know, uh, the procedure or the process that we normally have is that after we have the risk assessment, we develop the plan, you know, you do a preliminary survey and so forth. And then uh, after performing those processes, we would normally require documentation. You know. Because of your increased engagement, meaning the increased engagement may also mean uh, providing updates, uh, not necessarily waiting for the completion of the audit, but providing updates along the way and in effect testing some uh, responses from the, from the management. Uh, you are able to decide whether there are certain findings or observations that you have that need not be documented because for all you know, it was not valuable. You know, we, we can have a difference in opinion uh, between management, but after listening probably to the explanation of management, sometimes you realize, oh, I, I did not document that, or I, there, there's, there, I don't have to spend so much effort to document everything or to write a report on it for this particular area of observation. So there's a mindset shift, no? Agile internal audit frameworks can deliver briefer, timelier reports with fewer words and more visuals. So what are we encouraged in Agile internal? Frequent updates given to your stakeholders. You know? So if you, if you had an introductory meeting or what you call the, the opening conference with your uh, auditee at the start, or with, especially with the head of, of that particular operations or, or process, then it should not be that the next meeting you're going to have with them is already at the end of the audit. Normally, what, what the agile auditing requires is that maybe after a month uh, you get to visit the, the, the head of the uh, and say, oh, we're, or, or lady, maybe after two weeks, if the engagement is just short and see him and saying, oh, we're, we're, we're still here. We're still, uh, uh, the, on, the audit is ongoing. But however, there are certain matters that I would like to, to discuss with you that may be of your interest, that these are the observation and so forth. You are already testing your, your findings. You're already testing your observations and communicating this to your auditee or to your uh, stakeholders is very important to them. It's already of value. You know why? Uh, 
the fears of most auditor is that if you're going to communicate prematurely your findings, the fear of most auditors that I know, especially for the low level, is that, oh, they might resolve this or correct this and it will never, it will not anymore become a finding at the end of my report. Okay. And I always tell my auditors before, or the auditors that used to work with me before, is that we are not in the in the business or in the process of you know trying to earn points, good points, or Poggy, what we saw good points to management. We're here to help the organization. And therefore, if and when you communicated or updated the concern officer about your you know your your new findings no without yet waiting for the conclusion of the audit and in the process the manager addressed the problem or corrected the problem such that when you are about to report formally or make a report thus the problem has been gone now there's a way of communicating that you know if you believe uh, uh there's no need to mention that in the report why not no uh as I said, we're not there, to, we, we're not doing the job to get good points. We're there to help the organization. We're there to uh, render a service that is to assist and be a business partner of the different process owners such that uh, we're able to contribute in the attainment of the objectives of the organization. So uh, it, it requires a change of mindset. No? An agile internal audit frameworks can deliver briefer and timelier reports as through through that uh, communication. No? So it does not need to be in a written report. So most of the, uh, the practice in the agile auditing is that more interactive uh, communicating to the, the auditee or to the, the head of the function and really more conversational such that you're also able to gather inputs as to whether they are uh, going to respond to it they're going to work on it and and you know if you if you put yourself in their shoes you know if, if you put yourself in their shoes you would appreciate the auditor you know you would appreciate if he tells me uh this early because the earlier i can resolve the problem the better for the organization no worry that you know your findings in the end will not be there uh, because the auditor already addressed the problem that should not be a big concern so when should an internal audit consider agile audit approach? No? So when, at when? This is more, in, uh, this becomes an imperative when there is a need to complete more audits in the same or less time. So you could just imagine if you used to perform audits, uh, let's say that usually takes you two months, you know, from the start of your opening conference for two months, the auditee or the organization you're auditing will be in uh, with anxiety, you know, because what is the outcome? And then they never hear anything from you, you know. So in terms of uh, productivity, it, it, it might not be a good reflection also because it would mean also that there is less work done uh, over a period of time. So some uh, it, it is a good practice also for the internal audit management to develop some performance measures you know to detect as to whether are we uh, uh, more productive than before are we so the need to complete more audits because that is a reflection of your performance the more you're able to cover the more you're able to help the organization okay so you adapt the agile audit approach uh, when there's need to complete more audits in less time because there will be after this pandemic I guess budget wise uh, uh, the, the organization will not be as generous as before because everybody is coping and is trying to recover from uh, the crisis and uh, They would definitely want to put their money where they see value in it. Okay. Now it also it, it's also become uh, necessary to have this agile audit approach when there is a need to promote closer relationship with stakeholders. You know. uh, this is where you they will find value in in your work if they get a lot of information from you. So it uh, in in effect you promote closer relationship with them. You, know. you deliver more. It is also uh, a, an imperative when there is a need to deliver more relevant, higher impact reports with less documentation. You know. uh, when we say less documentation, don't bother with it. It, does, it simply means that 
uh, convey first, no? I mean, as much as possible, be able to provide insight, be able to provide advice at the earliest possible time, at the closest to where you found it, uh, because this is where you are valued at. And documentation may follow, but now you are more selective. What you need to document, document those that you think has been uh, useful in your engagement. Need to respond quickly and effectively as strategies, priorities, technologies, competitors, and risk evolve. You know, when you are in a in a crisis mode, uh, you know it's like things does not become formal. You know, you you have to be flexible, very dynamic, and very responsive as things could change or evolve uh, anytime. You know? So either could be a, a threat from competitors, either a threat of the technologies, especially with the cyber uh, hacking uh, concerns, there would be a change in the strategies of the company and so forth, and also issues that may be raised by regulators. So as much as possible, the, uh, the auditor should be ad more flexible. So there is a question here. Uh, will agile auditing replace risk-based auditing as the standard internal audit approach? Can we have the poll for this? Yes or no? Okay, Mr. Echo? Yes. This is the poll. All the participants, will agile auditing replace risk-based auditing as the standard internal audit approach? We give like about uh, one minute for the poll. For the polling. Mm -hmm. This is interesting because I think most of the participants say no <laughs> to answer <laughs> the question. It's more clearer in terms of consensus you know, compared to the other one where you have a 50 40, you know. But this yeah. one is more clear, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to note that. But there are only yeah percent voted so I hope others can still vote yeah yeah okay we have seven yeah. participants okay it's already one minute miss Helen okay Are we continue so, the poll okay yeah so from the result it shows that the majority if not uh, uh, and you are right no it does not change the risk base uh, to uh, just to explain the the table that I showed, where uh, uh, I, I I put an arrow uh, on on the the three tables that I, I showed you, no, the risk based auditing, then the remote auditing, then the agile. It is simply means that you know the baseline really the baseline discipline is risk based, okay, and uh, as you go through the the changing times, like because of this pandemic, the remote auditing has become, you know, prominent and more uh, uh, important or uh, needed because of the constraints that we are in. Now, because of the new normal, there are more expectations and requirements, and therefore, being an ad in uh, adapting an agile auditing still on a risk based is now uh, called for or more important. So it does not change, you're right, it does not change the standard, the baseline uh, requirement is still risk-based, okay? Mm -hmm. So now we'll proceed to the next, so with the results. So this is now my perspective. Uh, I, I really had a difficult one to say uh, because I'm not, I am not saying this, this, and, and make this as, as representative of the IIA's view. No, it may, may, it may coincide with probably the advice of IIA, but uh, this is my perspective or my view in terms of what internal audit roles can play in a business recovery setup or mode. Uh, so when we say business recovery, uh, this is where, hopefully this is in 2021, uh, this is where businesses are trying to recover. Uh, the, the normal life is business activity is increasing and, and unemployment hopefully goes down when there are now more employees to work. And, and, and as I said earlier, uh, the way we do things 
in the lockdown has become the new normal. No? It, we might go back to certain extent, but it has already influenced or dictated the new way of doing things because of that experience. So assuming in that kind of mode in the new normal and you are now thriving, meaning now recovering in business, there are three uh, roles that, that uh, I have uh, thought of and which uh, you may uh, agree or disagree with me, but they're pretty general. First is you still remain as, a, as an assurance provider. That will not change, okay? It may, the, the, it may still, uh, uh, whether you are in good times and in bad, you remain as an, primarily as an assurance provider. Otherwise, if you are not, what is the value of your independence? And you can be an ordinary uh, operations personnel or functional personnel in the organization. Now, this confirms that organization has plans and structure in place that adequately protect uh, the relative to an overall risk management. Now, so what I mean is that as an assurance provider, the, the specific need under a business recovery setup is to, for the auditors to confirm that the organization has plans and structure in place and is adequately protected relative to the overall risk management plan. Remember, when you are now in a business recovery plan, uh, stage, you would want to make sure that your plan is one that will work and that will bring the organization back to its original height. No? If it's the leading organization, if it's the leading company before, you would like to make sure, you would like to help the organization uh, reach that stage again. And therefore, if you are, if I will put myself in, in management or in the board, I would like the auditors to be able to assure me and confirm to me that the plans and structure now put in place by the company mm. is adequately protected because that is what is, has been designed to bring the company back to its original state or to its original position. You know? So it really more focus on the risk management. So there will be more activities in probably assuring the risk management plan of the organization, making sure that it has the, 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 the organization, everybody in the organization. By the way, when you are a mature uh, organization in terms of risk, you know, everybody is a risk manager. Even the low level people could yeah. be a risk manager. You know? So take now, but the difference in this particular uh, assurance provider uh, role take more of a take more the strategic perspective not uh, before uh, some organization would say oh, our auditors they just audit like this like that no? uh, and they are not perceived to be more taking on the strategic uh, importance of, of what they're looking at or what they're auditing at. So take the strategic perspective and that would even, if that would require using subject matter experts, you know, uh, in, in every organization, if you believe you need to have an engineer, if you need to have a, a, a lawyer in the organization, I, I remember I, I did, I was involved in, in one of the, uh, external quality assurance of a hospital and, and the internal audit of that hospital has a doctor and a nurse in their team. Uh, it may not be a full-time thing, but it's a regular uh, resource in the, in the team because the, the coverage of their audit essentially involves these disciplines. No? So also, uh, and be able to contribute by creating uh, or by helping the organization buy in, you know, for any changes. Because uh, what will happen in the organization in the business recovery side is change, change to, you know, to, to adapt now to the new mode, you know? and, uh, and, and, and really the auditors can be a valuable uh, service to the organization if it helps them to achieve this. You know? So. Be a, you remain to be an assurance provider, but now more on the strategic level, okay? The second is that you, you, you become an insight provider, you know? And uh, like the, in the agile, you no? Know? Why, why is it very important to engage your stakeholders, you no? Know? 
uh, as frequent as possible because you, your information, whatever you communicate to them is like an insight given to them. No? You, there may be no judgment yet because you are still confirming with them. You're still asking questions as to why this is happening. You're trying to secure explanations and so forth. So you become an insight provider in a more prominent way, meaning more consistent. No? As the saying, audit at the speed of risk, the, the, the demand really for the speed uh, in audit so that you can provide insight is, is very, very uh, pressing in this. Now, in a business recovery, you know, this is where uh, management or the company would like to have the momentum and the momentum of going up, not going down again or going up and down, up and down. You know? So this is where your insight is of valuable to the organization. You know? So it says here, adapt strategies for more timely results Share the results as the audit unfolds, reduce or eliminate levels of review. You know, uh, you will be surprised if you try to review the time spent uh, by your people and your supervisors or your audit managers in the different stages of the activity audit. And, you know, there, uh, you would notice that there is a, a good number of time spent in preparing report. Uh, it, well, for the low level, the documentation and the preparation report is sometimes a struggle, no? But uh, the new way of, you know, communicating has now shifted not only in writing, but more now on being interactive, presenting orally or through a formal presentation, no? So expedite, no? Re image your report, no? Your report need not be a long report that would take, that would discourage readers from reading. The longer the report, mm -hmm. the, the reader would say, uh, I will read that maybe tomorrow because, you know, I know it will take so much of my time. But if they see that your report is short or brief and precise and, and, and concise, so they would, you know, Say, oh no, anyway, this would take, not, not take so long and we'll read immediately your report, okay? So this is one role that we would like to be, that of an insight provider, because this is where value is being perceived by your stakeholders. Okay. And of course, the last would be for us to be perceived, perceived as a trusted advisor, you know? You cannot jump immediately to, immediately to a trusted advisor if you don't pass the insight provider. I would say for all auditors, be it in the lower rank, middle, or up, be courageous. Be courageous to offer advice or on critical issues and affecting positive outcomes to gain stockholder, uh, sh the share stakeholders' confidence. Uh, the Dilemma is that there are still some auditors who are afraid to approach senior level officers. You know? uh, it may not be, you know, uh, the fear would be whether the advice is logical or whether it's, it's the advice would be appreciated or not. Then probably state it in a way that you are testing your ideas. Like, for example, this is how I normally. Uh, sort of offer advice or uh, test my ideas, okay? So let's say uh, you just, you're auditing, the audit is, is ongoing in this particular function, let's say procurement, let's say, and you are mm -hmm. supposed to engage uh, with the head of, let's say, logistics with, for which procurement is under, no? and, and there has been some observations already noted and communicated to you by your by your audit manager and your staff and you you somehow uh, deliberately intend to you know update him of what's going on and 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 just to give some insights already and uh so when you get to see the man the the head or the vp for for logistics and say oh i just passed by to give you some updates we're still the audit is still ongoing and uh it might interest you that uh, there are certain observations that uh, we are now looking at, okay? So you, you see, I'm saying still looking at, so you're not saying it's a finding already, okay? 
And then I say, you know, we've noted that there were still, uh, there are some instances that uh, this, this process is not followed or you limit yourself to two bids when in fact, the policy says it's three bids. Uh, we are still verifying this, and and and, but but do you allow that? What is 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 your is your guidance in so far as you know, you know, reasons like you know there's not enough suppliers. Not, you, you know those things. It's conversation, but you're actually already testing your 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 uh, ideas, no, and how you're going to make recommendations, no. Uh, is there you, you somehow either toss the question to them or you test your ideas by saying, you know, in some companies, you know, they do this, they do that. Or don't you think it's logical that you do this, you do that, you know? So this is where the, in, the interaction becomes a valuable exchange of ideas and knowledge that uh, will really take time, no? That's why I'm saying be courageous. Do not be afraid to commit mistake. Uh, if let's say you said something that you would like to correct later, now make sure to go back, maybe uh, make a call and say, oh, by the way, I mentioned to you earlier that this is like this. I, I'd like to correct myself. You know, I, I realize this is not Be courageous to admit if you somehow overlook or you commit a mistake because you will also be respected for that, you know. If you did not uh, communicate to them that you know you you somehow had a different understanding or you, you need to be corrected, they will capitalize on that, especially if they know you're wrong. Okay, so I, I guess we're just human, no? Auditors who uh, admit and be courageous enough to also correct are perceived well, better than those that you know refuse to admit or refuse to correct. No, so. I guess we're, we're, we're at the stage where uh, I'm, I'm just sharing to you my perspective on what could be the roles of internal auditor in a business recovery. Now here, while you were tested during the pandemic tide or you were, you were uh, contributing, let's say, during the crisis time, uh, if they see value in what you did during the crisis time, definitely you will be sought off during the business recovery side and you know we, we want to build you know the reputation of internal auditors that we are not there as a burden we are we uh, we provide value you know? uh, then then do your work then do yours i mean knowledge is not given to you just in a silver platter you have to work for it you have to invest your time in it and you have to love it Thank you. And I hope I was able to give. So we can have the questions already for this last segment of my talk. Okay. Ready? Thank you so much, Miss Helen. I think it's really a um, very excellent presentation in theme of how internal auditor roles in business recovery, especially in this uh, pandemic era. Uh, in chat room, Miss Helen, there are several questions. Okay. But I would like to say hi first to our VIP uh, participant, Miss Helen. In this room, there are Miss Mrs. Ida Sundari. Yes. Principal Inspector in the Audit Board of the Republic of Indonesia. Thank you, Mrs. Ida Sundari. Thank you. And right. also, Ms. Yeah. Mia. Yeah, pleased to meet you. The Deputy in Development Audit Agency. Thank you for welcome, yeah. Mr. Dadang. Thank you. Yeah, Thank please, you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I hope this uh, presentation will help uh, either Audit Board of Republic Indonesia and also State Development Audit Agency and other private uh, sectors to improve and to gain solution in this uh, pandemic era. So the next question is from Mrs. Ida Sundari, our principal inspector. The question is, 
how internal auditor mitigate risk in audit and alternative procedure in conducting internal audit, Miss Helen. Um, we 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 have such thing as audit risk. Yes. For auditors, no. So what does that mean? Uh, the audit risk that we have is that we are not able to cover what we should have covered. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there might be some miss, if might call it, in our risk assessment uh, that uh, we were not able to capture. And so we missed in covering it in our audit. And, and if something happened, boom, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it's a reflection on uh, the audit. Now, how do we mitigate that? You know, how do we mitigate that? Uh, first, if the, the miss or the not covering it has something to do with limitations, meaning there was a limitation imposed by your auditee, or let's say for government, let's say, don't audit that, you know, there yeah. are certain, there are certain ministers or, you know, uh, high top level uh, positions that would say, don't audit that. Okay. The, if, if, if internal audit reports to a higher body, an independent body, you know, but because not all government corporations or uh, have an audit committee where you know we functionally report. The ideal setup really is that uh, it is good that uh, if you present your plan at the start, uh, you should be able to present so what we call assurance map. The assurance map will actually show the audit universe, let's say, of, let's say if you, in a, in a government corporations, these are all the facets or the business, or the processes in the organization. You have to communicate to your, let's say, audit committee that this is the universe, okay, of this corporation or this entity. And then you tell them that we normally cover this, 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 and that, okay, and we do not cover this, okay. And what you're saying to your audit committee is that we cover this. Do you agree or do you do not agree? Okay. Because if they say, no, you cover that. Okay. Then there's that mandate. Let's say if you did not cover because there was a limitation uh, imposed, then you disclosed. You know, I, I will not, we will not cover that because uh, management does not allow us to cover that. It's a very sensitive or we do not have the competency because if we disclose also that we do not have the competency, the audit committee will ask, what will it take for you to have that competency? Do you need to outsource this? Do you need to, you know, you, you provide all those options. So meaning uh, disclosing it is one way of, if not the sole only way to mitigate our risks. If ever you are unable to disclose it by any reason, that is really the risk that you are taking. So in audit, the only mitigating uh, a process or action that we have or that's available to us is disclosure. Anything that you disclose, mm -hmm. you're, you're safe. You, I've made known to you, like especially for limitations. I already mm -hmm. mentioned well, we're limited. You, you, there, you, you did not uh, provide any direction. So that's mean, that means a tacit approval that I don't need to cover. One of the areas that oftentimes we are not allowed to cover is compensation. Especially mm -hmm. for the private sector, most of my friends uh, in the same position would say we are not allowed to cover or to audit executive compensation. We disclose that. I disclose mm -hmm. that to the audit committee. This is the map. We cover this, this, and that. We are limited here. We are unable to do so. And, and normally, the, the response that is given to me by the audit committee, okay, you don't need to cover that. But you tell us if you believe there is a need to look at it. We will give you the mandate. Okay? So th that, that is the reverse. Even for the, for the uh, low-level auditors, uh, this is how I... No, no, it's not threat but this is how i educate them uh, in, the, in in so far as disclosure is concerned and i said you know if you commit a mistakes don't keep it okay tell your boss or the head immediately because the first action would be for us to solve uh, it correct it no don't keep it to yourself because if something happens then of course you will be responsible although 
all in internal audit will be dragged. So we also tell people in management that, you know, you have to disclose because if you don't disclose, the presumption is that it is at your level, okay? But if you disclose it to your higher level, it is now co-owned. The responsibility now is shared with your boss because you disclose it. So the same, the same is true really also for audit. Disclosure is the only meeting that we can have. I hope Ida is satisfied your 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 question or answered your. Okay, question. thank you, Ms. Ellen. <laughs> what was the second question, uh, Ardini? Okay, yeah. And is the alternative? Is there any alternative procedure in conducting internal audit? Well, you know, uh, one, one, one realization that I had uh, in uh, internal audit or the practice of internal audit, I thought all the while conducting survey is not on audit. But you know, it is really as conducting survey itself is, is an audit, you know, especially if what you want to cover or what you want to achieve is something that will end result provide assurance to your stakeholder. Like, like, like what I example to you, the whistle blowing. Mm -hmm. you know? And I said uh, part of the uh, assurance uh, that we provide the audit committee is that we do review the process, meaning first the structure, we review uh, whether it is credible in the sense that uh, people believe in the process. So we look at statistics, how many are reporting, is it growing, is it declining? Uh, and the final test really is asking the employees, do you know that there is such a thing as whistleblowing? There is a mechanism. Mm -hmm. Are you aware how to do it? If you tried and if you did report something, were you retaliated? Were you, you know, those things. And the feedback, and you know, the feedback from the employees, because we also guarantee anonymity or, you know, protection of identity. The, the feedback really was very surprising and very powerful, such that when we presented this to the audit committee, the governance committee was uh, asked that they also sit in the meeting and, and, and the end decision was to, for the governance to really work on, on that because audit will no longer uh, uh, take charge because the, it, there's an overlap also on the governance side. Because we said it defeated the purpose. One reason why we had to cover it because we noted a decline. Okay. Yeah. So we said, why are they not reporting? No, what, what, what could be the reason? So first year, it was alarming. The second year is going down and going down. Then when we did the survey, we found out that there were people who were retaliated. They were transferred to a far-flung area. <laughs> they, 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 you know, and, and we did a, a, what you call this, a, a round in different offices where we had to explain to managers uh, that when you are informed that there is a whistleblowing report in your area, do not look for the person because you know, the tendency for the manager is yes. to know that who among my staff mm -hmm. report and they will speculate, they will speculate and they will suspect and in the end, you know, will affect the person. Uh, and, and I said, and we told the managers, by the way, when we did a briefing of them and we told the managers, you know, if you try to look for that person, you can be a suspect that you are involved. Why are you looking for him? But we have a policy that says that's the mechanism for any employee, including managers, including officers to report. So, you know, rely on the system of, you know, the validation. If ever you are discovered or if you're found or reported that way, you will have a chance to really, you know, defend yourself. I mean, it's not like a democratic system where, you know, once somebody report automatically or judge or confirm as yeah. you know, there will be an opportunity to really validate. So sometimes it's a matter of culture also, you know, the culture of, you know, we, this is what we found that it, the Philippines is quite a common. Uh, the culture of, you know, you know, saving face, you know, you should have reported, that person should have reported to me. Why does he have to go to the whistleblowing, you know? 
I can act on it, you know, something like that. Yeah. So, you know, people are more comfortable if they report and just, and this, it's like, <laughs> say, I report this and you check. Yeah. It's like, say, you check. Because if I'm wrong, it's okay. I'm wrong. But if I'm right, then it helped the company. Simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Miss Helen, for the answer. Mrs. Inda, Ida Sundari, is it uh, enough for the answer? Yes, thank you very much. It's very clear. Thank you, Helen. Ida. Thank you, Mrs. Ida. Uh, there is an additional question, actually, Miss Helen. If we change uh, our plan, internal audit plan, with another additional audit plan, but we have still to stick on our previous audit plan, but we have, you know, really limited source in human auditor and then the funds. Do you have solution for that? Okay. So but we have, yeah, yeah. The, the Helen. One, these are the, what you call, these are the options, okay? Mm -hmm. So you have an original plan, let's say yeah. it's say, 10 engagement 10 programs, yes projects okay and then uh because of this pandemic or because of you know developments you need to cover more you know you have yeah. to cover more so yeah. so when you decide uh whether to continue with your Capacity. Now, second is that if you don't have the capacity, will management or the audit committee give you the resources to do the additional? No? Mm -hmm. Assuming that you can defend that this is a, this is a worthy uh, engagement to do. No? The third is that assuming that uh, they will give you the resource, do you, do you outsource or do you, you know, do you reassign among your people and... Yeah. and, and and, 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 and so forth. No? So th these are the other options. Normally, when you make your plan and present your budget, mm -hmm. uh, the tendency for the company is to you know, stick to that budget. Okay? Yeah. And uh, it's important that uh, in our case before, my experience is that uh, when we attempt to make allowance for possible, you know, mm -hmm. uh, management uh, does not like you know, th the feeling of, you know, uh, they call it jacking up your budget just for the allowance, you know. And, uh, and as a matter of discipline, they said, uh, mm -hmm. since your mission, since your service is very important, uh, we don't put an allowance. Anything you need, we will provide if there are supplemental requirements. So that has been our arrangement with management that, okay, we will not make allowance, but when there is a need and in the audit committee uh, approves it, then we will have the budget for that. So that has been a, a good arrangement we have. Now, normally, when there are additions to make, okay, you really have to look on the overall uh, plan. No? And even critically reviewing your existing plan. Because remember, when you develop the plan, that, that was as of that time. If there are changes, if there are changes in the conditions in the company or in the environment, and there might be some, you know, uh, need for looking at priorities or looking at whether the risk still exists. You know, the, the, my my experience is like this: when you present your uh, audit plan to the audit committee, it is possible it will leak to management you know because remember when you present the when you develop your plan you also discuss it with management so management will have an idea what areas you will be looking at okay some uh, very very uh, responsive I may call it responsive or uh, managers would tend to clean up you know ahead you know you know, you know you're in the plan of audit you know, you know. So they may not know specifically what you will look in their area, but because they know there's an audit in procurement, so most likely they will know that. Okay. So having that advanced information, some people will tend to resolve or you know, correct everything what they think are their weaknesses. So before you go there, 
you know, the risk has already been mitigated, you know. So yeah. normally, when it is time to review the plan, whether to add and know, we, we actually review everything, okay? Do a preliminary assessment, whether mm -hmm. the risk exists in that particular area. And some would tend to go down. So if the risk is going down, then it's deprioritized. Then put in the more pressing without really changing the budget. You know, you know those things. So when you go back to the audit committee to present any changes to the approved plan, you justify we're, we're deferring this or we're or deferring this because we see any improvements in this area and the risk has come down, you, such thing. So you, so the advice really is that the more frequent you you update your plan, the better. It's not like a reflection on you. No, it is more responsive to the risks that you are looking at. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Miss Helen, for the answer. Actually, it's already reached twelve o'clock in Indonesian time but if you want if you willing to spare like 15 minutes Miss Helen because there is a lot of question from the participant that we haven't answered okay first uh, is the next question is from Mr. Dwi Setiawan uh, director of research and development in the audit board of the Republic of Indonesia uh, Mr. Dwi asking how internal audit how internal auditor can anticipate and give some insight and foresight to the management because there is opportunity if organization can shifting to adapt the situation okay uh, I, I would say this is where the insight giver or, uh, or the, the trusted advisor is an uh, for some uh, for the auditors now what we normally advise that uh, if you somehow have some insights, uh, like observations, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that the, that management may not be aware of. For example, people have been talking about this particular issue, you know, but it seems like management is not aware. People are already talking about it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's like it has been the talk of the town, and it's like the president is the last person to know, you know. If you, if you observe that that's happening, I guess the auditor can be one of the persons that should be brave enough to communicate to the president or to the whoever is the highest or the person that you believe can address it. Uh, in my case, I did that once. No? Uh, it's not necessary, but the perception, there has been a perception against, let's say, the CEO that, you know, he's like this, he's like that, he's like this and like that. Everybody, every time I attend a, you know, a, a pit for tat for with some friends, in a, or it's like it's the talk of the town. But I, I noticed that it's like the president does I not know. aware that he's been talked about for this particular action for this. And, and uh, you know, in one meeting, uh, in, in a session that I had to see him for something else. And then I, I somehow uh, conveyed to him by saying, you know, uh, sir, you know, um, I've been hearing a lot of talks about like this, you know, I don't know if you're aware of it. So, so I, I, I'm telling him, maybe you're not aware of it, but it seems like there are talks like this uh, scattered in, I mean, being talked about in, in many. Uh, and I, I wanted to tell you this because, you know, you may not be aware of it, you know. Uh, it, it may be because it's also your way of getting uh, a clarification from him or explanation. He said, oh, maybe because like this, and you know, you know the, the president will value that. No. The, not all my officers will be courageous enough to tell their president and say, you know, you're like this, you're like that. You're like, but for the auditors, you know, you can give a feedback. You know, you know I've been hearing this talk and I, I'm telling you this because I... I just want you to be aware, you know, I'm just, it's like I'm saying, I'm just being nice. And, and you know, I can say, you know, I can say difficult uh, statement with you and, and nothing more. It's like work only. This is just work, you know. And I, I guess that's, that, that would be a certain, you know, a way of uh, an approach that you can do when you have certain insights on what's happening in the organization. Take that, you know, take that, uh, uh, that courage to do though and whether 
he, the response will be negative or like, it's just, I'm just telling you, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't mean anything. I'm just telling you so that you may be aware. Yeah, yeah. That's really good answer, uh, Miss Helen. Uh, so we need to be courage because a new normal in this crisis time needs uh, new innovative things for the solution. And for the rest of the question, actually, Miss Helen, is more about the agile audit. Yeah. So first is the question from Mr. Purbo Wijanarko. Uh, he asking what is significant step to uh, prepare conducting this agile audit and then is it from uh, the question from Fauzan Wahyu Abdi is effective coordination sorry effective coordination related to risk management able to support the agile audit and then the question from Sri Dini Indarini is remote auditing or agile auditing has to support it by regulation or policies. And the last question from Mrs. Ihtaria Shazia is it participatory audit can also conducting in agile audit way. Okay. So, so just to because there are the belief yeah. variant and I can just have one answer. Now look at look at remote auditing and agile auditing yeah. as simply like a an adjustment to your risk base. Okay, you still follow the risk base. Okay, you adapt to remote when it is called for in the situation. You calibrate your risk base to an agile, more flexible when it is also called for for the situation. Now, every company, every organization may be in different stage of development. Some are mature, some are already sophisticated, some are still backward, and so forth. So you have to calibrate. Okay, you cannot do an agile auditing when the, the organization is still backward. You know, because they're not demanding. In fact, they do they do not want you to audit. You know? So 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 those things. You know, so you you call it. It's just saying that uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, there is more expectation, you know, the more the need for us to present the value of our work. And thus you have to be more flexible because things can change overnight. And I agree with the observation earlier that there should really be a close coordination with risk management. Uh, not all risks are uncovered in the audit. There are risks that may be known to management that probably the risk manager is aware of over us. So there should be a close coordination with them, a close, uh, and uh, you know, you, you may not also be, there may not be enough time to bother the president always and talk to him, you know, the risk manager, if, if he's working also well, you know, assuming that he is effectively functioning well in the organization, can be your source of information, you know. And by the way, the risk manager will also talk to you to get some inputs from what you know from your audit. You know? So it's really complementing. And, and therefore, do not worry anymore when to build Agile. As, as, as I said, calibrate it. The base is still risk-based. You know, apply Agile, apply remote. It can be on different varying degrees. You know? So you can have, you can have uh, Agile in one, not Agile in another. You know, those, those things. But just remember the keyword. When you say agile, you are very flexible, very flexible. That's why the demand is for it to be timely, to be fast, and on us. Miss Helen, by doing flexible way, does it need uh, policies to base on uh, or okay. written policies? Yeah. Um, in 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 some companies, uh, they may cite. No, no, the updating now of the policies, the internal policies of internal audit, because these are the methods, you know. Uh, they may update by putting remote auditing already and some, uh, and may provide certain guidelines what to do and not to do, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the same is true for Agile. But, you know, uh, because this might be so wieldy in terms of documenting and what, this is where the business of software development in Agile auditing is now 
no there are certain organization marketing agile no? but actually you know need exactly a, a, you know if you have an a, an in-house system already for your audit management you can use that it is like how it the, the only application there is how you do things no you are more adapted you're more you're flexible and you you work faster you know because mm -hmm. because it is called for in your condition or in your situation yeah, yeah. So, so the first is we need to calibrate yeah our condition now uh, within our organization and how to guidelines between do do and don'ts in agile yeah, yeah, auditing the policy side no if, if ever if ever uh uh the, the audit management would say that there will be instances where a remote uh, auditing can be done no uh, because if if, if the audit results is more reliable in in a face to face or in you know then that is it. if if that's allowed but because you know as we said the new normal is gearing towards you know uh working remotely then that can be uh it might become an institutionalized process because calls for time yeah 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 Thank you, Miss Helen, and uh, thank you for the participant that already gave question about agile auditing and remote auditing. Uh, include Mrs. Sainam also question the same things. Uh, so sorry because I need to collaborate them as one question, and then the other question. I think this is the last question is from Mr. Ahmad Afwan. He is working in insurance company. And then as an internal auditor, uh, he is shifting also as a project manager. 50% of uh, for, uh, this project is for the business continu continuity. So is it independence for internal auditors to also handle the operational matters, Miss Helen? Yeah, my, my question first is: Is this uh, a temporary setup because of the yeah. the, uh, the demands of time management? Or yeah, if 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 uh, this is a permanent setup, uh, it may not be. It's it's tax, It's going to tax him well, no. Uh, and uh, there might be certain uh, occasions where he will really encounter dilemma, no. Mm -hmm. uh, the only guide that was given to us in internal mm -hmm. audit is that is when you are. A, uh, when you allow yourself to assume certain roles for as long as you do not make any decision management decision uh, you're safe but sometimes you know if you're given that project lead no uh, you are going to make yeah. decision, you know you're yes, going to a make dilemma decision. yeah so uh, the dilemma might be more serious as you go along so if it's yeah. temporary or not but it's true that uh, uh, the standard says that we can we are allowed to take some roles mm -hmm. uh, for as long as this is managed or if not being um, monitored by the audit committee to make sure uh, this is uh, this mean this will not compromise the independence of the person mm -hmm. I remember uh, there was a year in my in my career life mm -hmm. where I used to I used to I am the CAE but I was given the 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 role of compliance officer for corporate governance it mm -hmm. was very useful for me because i uh, i am able to identify areas where i i, I also need to look at so i use the audit mm -hmm. and, you know the weakness I, compliment yeah and then yeah because i get to have access no no and it was also an opportunity for me to interact with the board members because i i do the compliance for but uh it, it was just temporary i think mm -hmm. maximum was two years but some an, another role that can be taken by internal auditors is the risk no uh, for as long as there I, I don't know if you're familiar with the diagram that shows what is what is legitimate uh, for as long as you do not make decisions uh, that in effect uh, like you are the one managing or you are the one responsible for the decision yeah, yeah. then uh, that may compromise your independence. Okay, then it will be okay. I think, uh, I hope Mr. Ahmad Afwan is already, uh, the answer from Miss Helen already answered your question. And I think that is the end of our okay. question and answer session. Miss Helen, I want to thank everyone for asking those great 
question, uh, but I want uh, maybe I want to ask to Miss Helen, do you have any closing statement maybe for all participants um, here? I, I guess in this time of crisis, um, first is I ask you to pray. <laughs> Let's pray that you know there's an end to this, mm -hmm. that soon the vaccine will be uh, out and yeah. uh, we don't want loved ones to go, you know, stay mm -hmm. safe and let's just do our job what we can do possibly with our limitations that we have mm -hmm. and let's help everyone be generous be generous that's all okay thank you miss helen for your closing statement it is good to continue the discussion like this in our next webinar and then uh miss helen there are also questions from participants if they can have your email, if yeah. they want to discuss uh, further with you with any uh, topics related, maybe you can share uh, your email chat in the chat room. And then um, I want to end this webinar now by thanking Miss Helen for coming in and discussing the important issues with us. And it's really a rather long webinar. It's almost like two and a oh. half hours. Yeah, but the participant is really uh, support and interactive. And I believe this webinar has been very valuable for all of us. Thank you all. Thank you, Miss Helen. Thank yeah. you.